Welcome back to The Lincoln Project. I'm your host, Reed Galen. Today, I'm joined in studio by my fellow co-founder of The Lincoln Project, host of LPT, LPTV's The Breakdown, author of the New York Times bestsellers Running Against the Devil and Everything Trump Dutch Touches Dies, and host of the podcast Rick Wilson's The Enemies List. It's the Rick Wilson. Rick, hey, thanks Reed. for being here. Good to be in the studio. Also joining me in studio today is Trigby Olson, a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project and president of Viking Strategies LLC, a Washington, D.C.-based public affairs and political consulting firm. Trigby, welcome back. Reed, thanks for having me. All right, guys, so before we get started, I just want to mention to everybody out there that we're streaming today's episode of the podcast live on YouTube. So if you're watching live, welcome. And if you are listening to the podcast the way you normally would, I ask you to go over and look at the U Lincoln Project's YouTube channel and have a look at the video. We're all here together in our Washington, D.C. studio. And so, Rick, Trigg, I'm glad you were able to join me today. Yeah, happy to be here, man. All right, so, gang, we've got a lot to go over today. Um, and the good news is we've got plenty of time to do it. So I want to talk about what the, the group of Republican members of Congress who live in districts that Biden won. We're calling the Endangered 18. Right. We'll get to them. Um, also, how a third-party candidate might fit into 2024, and I think we should spend a little time on, on our buddy Ron DeSantis while we're there. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get into that, we're all here in D.C. together, and last night was the State of the Union. Uh, Joe Biden, I thought, gave a great speech. Um, Rick, you noted that in a, in a, a snap survey overnight, 72 percent of rep right. respondents said it was a good speech. So let's talk about that. Rick, what do you think was the strategy from the White House and the president? And how do you think it played out over an hour and 10 minutes? I think two things happened last night that haven't really been noticed in the conventional wisdom stuff as much as they need to be yet. Right. The first is that <clears throat> Joe Biden laid out a whole bunch of populist things that aren't crazy. He talked about things that are going to have a meaningful impact on people's lives among a demographic group of independents, right. soft Republicans, and Democrats who the Republicans have been poaching. Oh, you mean Americans? You mean Americans, yes, people who don't live in coastal <laughs> cities or in the right. or in the or like the deep red states. Right. These folks who were gettable by Republicans because Trump would come out and say, I love America and I'm proud we're going to be made in America. Well, those messages, as much as sophisticated people think, oh, those are stupid, that's just, no, those things work. So Biden last night talked about good jobs, about industrial jobs, about construction jobs. Made in America. Made in America. Things that are going to have a meaningful impact of uh, folks who don't have a college degree. You know, the, the proverbial guys who take a shower, you know, after work. Right. Those things, <clears throat> I think, were, were layered into the speech over and over again. Um, there was some griping on the left, not enough about climate, not enough about guns, not enough about, it doesn't matter. This was an opening bid for the 2024 election. He laid out the strategy that the campaign's going to pursue, and I think it was very effective in that regard. He also had a big advantage is that Joe Biden's been to this rodeo. Right. He's been, he's been to probably every State of the Union address since 1972. Right. Okay? Yeah, right. I mean, I, seriously. Yeah, either as, either as either a member, as, a, as, a member, as sitting behind as the VP, president, or as president. Correct. Right. Yeah. He understood what would happen. He right. knows Kevin McCarthy doesn't run the show there. And he knew the jackasses in the party were going to hoot and holler and scream at him. And they did. So there's the, there's the political theater aspect of it, yeah. too, which he knows better he than these other people. He understood it better than they did. Right. He knew the camera would turn to the assholes like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Right. And he knew what would happen. And he was kind of grinning a couple. He was like, uh, I got keep, you. Keep talking. Keep right. talking. Keep bringing it in. And he, he really had a very successful evening because they did that. And then you saw that, you know, the response to him, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, in arguably one of the worst, like worse than Bobby Jindal. And that, but, but this, in the, in the long running, you know, series of right. disasters that are Republican responses. Oh, I mean, right. Marco, Jindal. I right. mean, the, the, only, the only one I thought, the only thing I thought about last night, and you and I were together, we're talking about it. That was like clickbait MAGA bullshit. Right. It was only meant for the crazies. It was only meant for the Newsmax OAN crowd. It was only meant for this, this, these mouth breathers who think that there's a global conspiracy to make them worship Satan. And it was... And Sam Smith is Satan. Yeah, well, yeah, obviously. Beelzebub. Uh, yes. Obviously. Yeah, <laughs> completely. <laughs> so, so Trigby, let's talk about the Republicans for a second. So uh. it was very interesting to see, and, and, I, and I thought that it was interesting to see not only how the White House staff whether or not it was the speech writers, um, you know, the leadership and the president himself constructed the speech from a, from a topical <coughs> perspective, but also 
that they knew that there was an opportunity, and I thought it was really important that Biden recognized it on the fly when he started talking about how Republicans wanted to cut Social Security <coughs> and Medicaid right. and, and Medicare, excuse me, and he knew that they couldn't let that go by. Right. And they start screaming at him, they start hollering at him, and he leads them into this box canyon, and he's like, okay, great, we've all agreed, we're not gonna cut Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> and you could even see McCarthy, who's trying his best, like, not to smile or do anything, mm -hmm. like, realized he's been gotten, right? Like, the swamp oh. creature reappeared, like, oh, that right. was pretty smart. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about, like, why should you be surprised that Marjorie Taylor Greene and her Cuella DeVille, um, you know, outfit, you know, stood up and screamed, you're a liar. Oh, I think they knew that he could beat them into it. Right. I mean, there was an element of the whole thing that reminded me of, like, sitting around with my buddies back home in Wisconsin drinking beer in a bar, and yet you're having a conversation about politics or sports or whatever, and you know that somebody sitting at the next table is going to chirp up because you've known them forever. Right. And, right? Like, they knew that she wouldn't be able to help herself, and they walked right into it. And Kevin McCarthy... You know, I think a lot of people who probably view the Lincoln Project look at Kevin McCarthy and they're like, man, you know, that guy. But he's really, a, he's kind of an operator and he does sure. understand sure. sort of the personal side of politics. And like, he had to be sitting there between Biden congratulating him on being elected right. speaker. And I hope, you know, and then, he, and then he adds the little knife. Hope it doesn't ruin your reputation that I like you, Kevin. Right. And then he's right, reaching out to Mitch McConnell, my longtime friend Mitch. And by the way, who looked terrible. Yeah, he didn't uh, he look He really looked good. really unhealthy. Yeah, and you know, I wonder is that the stress and strain of all of this? Is there something else going Mitch, on? Mitch Whatever. looked like he's on death's door. I gotta yeah, be honest. Yeah, he didn't look very good. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> I have no insight into that, but he did not. He did not look good. Uh, and then you got Marjorie Taylor Greene jumping at the bit. Now they've created a new cycle where, you know, Rick Scott is on the defensive and Marjorie. <laughs> Angry you know, Rick Scott. Rick Scott, 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 the, Rick Scott the gift that? that keeps on giving. You right. know, right? Ron Filipkowski had a tweet this morning that was uh, because Rick Scott is losing his mind about this. And Ron said, I think the best thing that I do is show pieces of video that the MAGAs thought would only be seen by their people. Right. Well, and then you and had George Santos you know, calling Mitt Romney an asshole. And Mitt Romney on the floor. His frickin' clock. Right. You don't belong here. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so, but you know, I think also is you saw that when they were they were hollering back at, at Biden, right, Trigby, and you saw McCarthy a couple of times like mouth to his conference, like stop it, right. calm down, right. which. There had been reports that in the conference meeting earlier in the day, he said, none of you do this. Behave yourselves. Right. And so it was also the perfect illustration, I think, not only about his weakness, but also, Rick, the, the illustration of how crazy the, the Republican conference is. There is no more fundamental rule in, a, in the world than don't fuck crazy. Mm -hmm. And he knew that the deal he was making, he knew by bringing Marjorie Taylor Greene into his inner circle, that she would be the most powerful person in the house mm -hmm. mm. after Kevin. He knew that to settle down the Don Bacons and the moderate, so-called moderate Republicans, that he was going to have to play, try to play both games. But you can't. Right. Gresham's law of politics, you know, the Gresham's law of economics is that bad money drives out good money. Mm -hmm. Bad ideas drive out good ideas. Bad people drive out good people. Right. And the bad people control it. And they know they have Kevin over a barrel. They know that they can call for a vote of no confidence anytime they want when Kevin gets off the reservation. They know they can withhold. You know, Matt Gates was able to hold about 20 votes together during the speaker's contest. Right. right. I will bet you Matt could hold together probably 40 votes now to cause chaos and disruption, and they know it. Marjorie knows she has maybe 50 votes that she can influence in some way, and they know it. Kevin right. knows it. The gun is to his head all the time. The hammer is back. The, the lunatics are in charge of the asylum. Even a small fraction of crazy would have disproportionate power in the MAGA media ecosystem. Right. And Kevin last night, like you said, he was struggling not to smile. He was struggling not to, to clap. The guy didn't clap when they talked about shooting down the weather balloon, the Chinese right. spy balloon. Right. He didn't clap when Biden was talking about rebuilding a better and stronger American economy. Right. Well, because that none of that they don't see any of that as good for them. Correct. Therefore, if it's they not want good the for chaos us, and the dark. Yeah. So, so Trigby, let's talk about that. You know, we don't we don't spend a lot of time on heavy policy. 
Right. So let's not get heavy on policy, but let's just talk about the debt ceiling for a second, which is if now Biden has maneuvered them into a place where right. Republicans cannot support cutting Social Security and Medicare. Correct. Right. And if they support cutting defense spending, right, then they're weak on defense. Right. The discretionary piece, the part that Congress actually can do much about on any given day is not very big. So what are they going to do? Because there's no place else to cut money I mean, that's going to have any tangible impact right. on a quote unquote, you know, debt, you know, debt deal. Well, and here's the other thing on the debt deal, right? Like if they default on the debt and it's the Republicans fault, it's going to increase the national debt because we're going to be paying higher interest rates yes, and interest right. is the highest cost the federal government pays. And ironically, we're going to pay so much of that higher interest rate to China. Right. 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 But, but I mean, also, right. Right. I mean, this, this <laughs> right. is the, you talk about but the just like anybody who has debt, narrative. the definition of debt, guys, is money you've already spent that you right. owe somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so in 2017, 2018, right, these guys spent like they had Matt Gates's dad's black Amex. Right. Right. And we're never planning on paying the bill. You know, they. Um, I saw one of the, I don't know if it was Mike Lee or one of those other goons was like, oh, no, it was maybe Nikki Haley, tax and spend, tax and spend, tax right. and spend. But on the fiscal sanity scale, right, right Republicans have been don't tax and spend. Mm -hmm. So it's they don't want to cut anything either because they know the politics is bad for them. Right. But they also want to placate the sort of plutocrat class and the corporate class with as many small, with as many low tax things as they can. Right. Um, except, of course, now, Rick, where it comes to working class Americans, where their other big policy thing is a 30 percent sales tax on every American, which is right. probably if it's not the most regressive plan in, in American history, I'm not sure what is. Uh, there's nothing to rival it. Right. I mean, the idea that that you're going to end up with a with a 30 percent sales tax that supplants the income tax. It, first, the math doesn't work. Right. And I'm no economist, but the math doesn't work. I can I can do I can do some some basic figuring. Um, and the second part of it is, <coughs> this is an economy that has been, that a lot of what's driven this populist movement, this economy has been seen as unfair, mm -hmm. stacked the wrong way. They don't even understand if they passed that national sales tax idea, their own base would rebel mm -hmm. against them. It Quick would drive thing. a further wedge. It would further divide. Yeah, but Rick, America. these are the same people who, quote, want everybody to have skin in the game. Well, Rick Scott wants wants people to work until they're seventy five years old, and and you know if Granny can't get by on that, well she, then then she should just go out and, and well look maybe open if, an only thing maybe if Scott hadn't stolen one point seven billion dollars from Medicare we wouldn't have well, and old people right yeah this is neat. he is he is the all time reigning champ of of ripping off uh, Medicare. Right. The I don't all -time know where he champ. thinks that he's going to run for president. He's not. I think he said he's not. He said he's not this time. <coughs> but but that's what he clearly wants to. Oh, be. he definitely wants to. And right. and and I want my hair to come back. And right. He's the happen. weirdest. I, I don't know if you've ever noticed that Rick Scott's affect is truly fucking bizarre. And I I kept thinking about him on the debate stage in the in the Republican primary. Those long ass arms and those weird long fingers flipping around and his odd hand gestures. I just. What Trump would do to Rick Scott would be glorious. Well, he looks like the cloners in the early Star Wars movies. I think, <laughs> I think what aliens. what Joe Biden did to Rick Scott yesterday is glorious. I mean, oh, he, he 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 handed because he also did, he also did McConnell a favor. Yeah, right, right? he did. Right. And here's the thing: like I talk about the seven rules for dealing with autocrats, right? Look at what Joe Biden. And one of them is zero use zero sum judo. That's right. exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. He took Marjorie Taylor Greene and absolutely flipped her. Right. Uh, and her bizarre outfit, which I, I'm not quite... I mean, what I is mean, that, like, fascist chic? I, listen, I the, don't know what... All, if, all, if Kristen Cinema had not been dressed like Big Bird fucked a banana <laughs> last night, she would have won the, won the prize. But Marge's, like, Cruella de Vil outfit was remarkable. It's so, crazy. So let's talk... I want to go back to, to uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders' response, Trigby. So as, as we noted at the top, Rick shared with us that 72% of respondents said Biden gave a good speech. Right. So tell us, if you listen to Sanders' response, right, that wasn't for normal people. No. Not as I can tell. Well, it certainly wasn't Sarah Huckabee Sanders who worked for Tim Pawlenty in 2016 right. no. uh, and was in Iowa. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, 
this is the thing about it, right? Like she's wrapping it in a war. Mm -hmm. You know, she starts off, Americans want to live free and prosperous and peacefully. Yeah, who doesn't? Right? Like, I think Ukrainians want to do that. Then she wraps it in a culture war of wokeism where the left doesn't know boys from girls. First of all, there's the whole war thing. You want to see a war? What's going on in the U.S. over, over debates about culture isn't a war. And if anybody's fighting a war, it's the right, not the, right, right. so much the left. Does it mean that there are people on the left that propose things culturally that are kind of foolish? I think, yeah, absolutely. Right. But you want to see a war? Look at what was going on in Dnipro yesterday. Right. That's a war. Right. That's a right. war. Right? Um, so describing it that way is a little bit ridiculous, but beyond that, think about the bigger thing that she wraps that in, right? Like, they don't know the difference between a boy and a girl. She's attacking, you know, the LBGTQ and all the rest. Um, but it's ironic because she would wrap herself in like, I am such a good Christian, blah, blah, blah. F false idols. Yeah, right? false idols. And language. here's the thing. I said this on a radio show in Wisconsin this morning, you know, I'm a simple Lutheran guy, evangelical, like a ELCA Lutheran, so the mm -hmm. liberal ones. But the bottom line is, like, the best sermons aren't the ones heard on Sundays in the pews. The best sermons are the ones lived from Monday through Saturday. Right. That's Tim Polenny's line, actually, right. that Sarah used to work for. Right. They're not living that. Like, right. so on the one hand, they're paying homage to, oh, I spend so much time on Sundays listening to the sermon. Look at how religious I am. And then they're attacking other people that's completely antithetical to what the underpinnings are supposed to be. Well, but, I call it the catalog of imaginary demons. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. They believe that there is this, this war being waged on them culturally. And they believe that if a kid reads a book in high school about someone being gay, then they're instantly going to turn gay. They believe if they read something about, about Islam, they're going to instantly turn into a Muslim terrorist. Right. This, this idea, you know, like the, Tudor Dixon in Michigan <laughs> was screaming up and down about trans athletes, trans athletes. Mm. You know how many kids in Michigan, trans kids in Michigan wanted to participate in sports? Two. Right. I think so, where I live in Utah, it was like eight. Yeah. And, right. and, and this it's idea that there's some massive wave right. of people trying to groom their children with transsexual it's bullshit but it's also but all it's, based in fear but it's right it's based yes. on a fear of a world that doesn't look like 1958 but it, it, but even in 1958 that's a great segue because then she does this weird <laughs> you know, Little Rock Central High thing right. with, with the Little Rock Nine. Yeah, trying to take credit for... Uh, Something that Dwight Eisenhower did. Right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, thanks. A, par a person who could not exist in today's Republican Party for 15 seconds. Right, but, but after, I think it was Brown versus Board of Education, mm -hmm. sends the 101st Airborne into Little Rock right. to desegregate the school. Right. Right. Something, to your point, n no Republican nominee in 2024 would advocate doing if they had to do it. Right. right? They would they, say, why are you trying to make our right, schools they woke? Would go, they would go back to separate bathrooms if they could. Right. Why are you trying to make our schools woke? But then, you know, the one last piece, Rick, though, is then she told this really weird meandering story about this trip to Iraq or Afghanistan where she doesn't mention Trump's name once. Right. Right. And then she tells this story about, about this soldier. It was all clearly made up. Right. Because she was having to fight through even reading it because she I think she'd read it right, twice. The bullshit meter was so was so pegged on that. But one. but one, like what was the point of that? Like that was such a non sequitur. Well, I think because because uh, maybe it was because they said Joe Biden's unfit to be commander in chief. I right. don't know. It was it to it, me. It was it, it was like, how many bridges can we go that are too far on too many weird things? It was it was at this at it was simultaneously over aggressive and stupid. Right. With ineffective. Again, it was meant only to churn the Newsmax, you know, smooth-brained oxygen thieves in the world right. and, and make them go, oh, yeah, culture war. We're at it, war. It, it, we're at war. I'm but, at war with Sam know. Smith. But, Here's but, the thing. But, this but, is the thing about her, though, in all seriousness. If her name had been Sarah Sanders from the outset, not Sarah Huckabee. Nobody right. would care. She wouldn't be governor of Arkansas. She's a Nepo she wouldn't baby. Have been speak she wouldn't have been the press She's secretary. She's a Nepo, of the Nepo president. baby. She mm. isn't, she, she yeah. wasn't that talented to begin with. There's a no. reason why Tim Pawlenty was out after the yeah, Iowa QED, caucuses. QED, every, every word from the podium and in the White do, House. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, well, and, I, and I think that's, this is where, again, I think we have to remind ourselves that if you live and occupy a space in a, and I want to call it a post-truth world, but a non-truth world right. or an untruth right. world, Trigby, then all of the lies she told from the podium don't matter. No. Yeah, right. They don't. No, no, not at all. And all of the lies or mistruths or exaggerations or insanity last That's night right. don't matter either That's because right. it's all a means to an end. Right.
Well, this is this kind of gets back to something I thought Biden did incredibly effectively last night. And I, I say this, and you guys get this. Like, Democrats, for us, as former Republicans, I'll break the fifth wall here. One of the things that, for me, has been so interesting working with Democrats is that, that is that, um, right, like, Democrats build, they talk about policy. Like, they, they're better people maybe in some ways than us in well, terms I mean, they approach we, Especially amongst the three of us, how high a bar could that we be? Build That's not a high bar for right? us. It is. Look at us. That's a reason why we're in here by ourselves. Right. But we build Republicans on the Republican side. You're taught, one, Al Davis, just win, baby. Win, baby. Two, right. build narratives. Build narratives around things that fire people right. up. You know what? Joe Biden did that last right. night. And yeah. I suspect he's, to kind of to Rick's point, he's going to go to Wisconsin today. He's going, I, I know that state well. He is going to Dane County, which is smart yep. because he can get a crowd. That's right. But he's going to DeForest, so he's going to the west side of Dane County, mm -hmm. which is actually where the Bannon Line voters in Dane County, it's where the we winning in Wisconsin in starts right, right there, there, runs right up I-94, mm -hmm. right, right up along here, and then right across to Green Bay. It is smart what he is doing. Yeah, and, and I think that's... Shockingly. And that so was what your team targeted in 2020. Yeah, and 2020, right? frankly. Yeah, and 2020. Right? I mean, yeah. and, that's, and, and I think that was the point, too, is that it was, you know, let's, let's take police brutality, police violence, right? It was a good example of a, of a politician, and that's what Joe Biden is, yep. who knew that he brought the family of, yep. of Tyree up mm -hmm. and said, this is unacceptable. And he said, but we need to do better by our police, mm -hmm. right? Yep. They're going out and risking their lives. They're, they are good people, largely good people. Their families are good people. And so it was a really good way of saying, you know, and imagine, imagine this, guys. You can hold two thoughts in your head simultaneously. Right. Cops shouldn't kill people. <laughs> we should give cops what they need to do their jobs better. Right. right. Right? Like, because as we've seen, right, there are very few people who live in neighborhoods that need policing the most who don't want no right. cops. The essential, right? the essential nature of the authoritarian argument is saying, well, unless we are allowed to, uh, unless cops can kill anybody they want, anytime they want, right. then it's going to be murder and blood in the streets, and only this, only the strong state, you know, can protect you. Which is, which is the antithetical and, to the words of, and this is why, you know, you have to, you have to really understand the meaning of what Sarah Huckabee Sanders said last night, which is she wants freedom, she wants government out of your life, but that's really not the case. No, not in the slightest. They, they, because they don't, and that's the other part, too, that I think McCarthy is running up against, which is in a normal time, he could govern a normal conference that wanted to govern. These people don't want to govern, and frankly, they're not very good at it because they have to make compromises, Trigby, as you know, and that's obviously a death knell for anybody in the Republican Party to say compromise is a four-letter word. I don't feel bad for Kevin McCarthy. I mean, he no, made his bed not. in normal right. times. He, when he was having trouble becoming speaker, he had gone to Nancy and said, listen, for the sake of the institution, can you get me 15 votes so I don't have to give in to the crazies? And, right. and look, but that's, he didn't, and, he had, which is exactly what he would do when he was minority leader in the California Assembly. He would go to the yeah. Democratic mm -hmm. speaker and say, I know you guys are going to do this anyway. I'll get you a couple of votes, but here's what my guys need. And right. the Democratic speaker would say, I can give you those things, and off they went. If Kevin had gone to Hakeem Jeffries and said, listen, dude, I'm going to give you some good seats on a few committees, yeah. okay? We're going to hook you up. Just help me out. I don't want to owe these fucking people. Mm -hmm. right? I want to put them in a box. I want to isolate them. I want to make them scream and yell all day long. But instead, he went to Marge and the rest of them and said, here's the gun. I'll load it for you. I'll cock it. I'll take the safety off. You hold it up to my head for the rest of my time. As no, look, he's, I mean, it's he's, because there's hundreds, there's, there's over a hundred of them in, in Mark, that, that wing is over. It's a hundred, it's a hundred plus. 132 members of the 222 member Republican conference mm -hmm. voted not to certify the yeah. 2020. Well, and these, right. the, and these, these 18 folks that we're targeting right now, which who are, you know, in the words of my grandmother, the cut hog squeals the loudest. Right. They are losing their minds because we pointed out there's no fucking difference between them. Right. There is not a difference between a Don Bacon or a Young Kim. They, pr they play a role in right. the primary where they say, I'm a moderate Republican, I'm soft, I'm sweet, I'm good, I'm nice. Right. And yet they all voted to put Marjorie Taylor Greene in charge right. of the House. So, so let's talk about that a little bit, Rick and Trigby. Yeah. So we have what we've called the endangered 18. 
Yeah. Okay. Right. They are 18 Republican members of the U.S. House who live in congressional districts that Joe Biden won in 2020. Right. right. These are swing districts. The the uh, the definition of swing districts. So few left, but there they are. So few left, but here they are. There's 18 of them. And we put out a memo, was it earlier this week or even last week, that said that we want to talk to these vote, these 18 members. Why? Because if they are truly moderates, right, if they are truly the only sane people left in this conference, then they should not allow the government to default on its debts. They should be willing to shed their partisan label, right, right and solve a massive problem for the United States, which is, if the government defaults, a whole bad, a whole host of bad things happen downstream. Right. Right. And so you mentioned Rick Don Bacon from Nebraska. There's a guy named Fitzpatrick from outside Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And and let's talk about this. So you know they all voted. I think for, for those of them that were in office during Trump's term, they voted three times for a clean debt ceiling. Right. No conditions. Right. No nothing. Trump said we got to raise the debt ceiling. McConnell said we got to raise the debt ceiling had to happen, right? No no comment, no fuss, no mm -hmm. muss, no nothing. It got done, mm -hmm. right? Um, now they're saying, well, there's got to be preconditions. A clean debt ceiling vote is off the table. Rick, as right. you noted, Bacon said that a discharge petition is off the table. So now that they're in the minority, right, where they can't take an easy vote, now there's all sorts of conditions. Now Joe Biden is not willing to negotiate. So, right. so Trigby, tell us about the danger of these people because they provide this sort of normal sheen to the crazy. Right. Well, what they end up doing is they end up appeasing because they're afraid, you know, I talk about vertical power structures and the Republican Party is an autocratic vertical with mm -hmm. Donald Trump yep. still sitting on top, which right. Ron DeSantis is finding out in a big way today. Don't read ahead, but we'll I get won't to him. jump ahead. Yeah. But it, that vertical still exists. They are afraid of that power structure. The Don Bacons of the world, you know, the easy path is appeasement mm -hmm. of it. Try and ignore it, it will go away. One of the things that's interesting when you spend a bunch of time in the former post-Soviet space is, like, they inherently want to ignore bad things because it's a survival mechanism. Right. right. It's like I it's didn't hear it, I didn't see like, it. Yeah, right. right. I don't know like, about so I just, camps. I'm What's just going on I'm, right. Yeah. And, and to a degree, that's what those guys are doing when they're doing this. Uh, and so our role has to be to hold them accountable. If, right. if Don Bacon you know, is meeting the minimum threshold, and the minimum threshold isn't voting for infrastructure bills or policy kind of stuff. Right. The minimum threshold is standing up for democracy, protecting things like the debt ceiling, which is a foundational piece of what makes America great, right? We mm -hmm. The US dollar. Like the whole reserve we'll currency thing. Well, you know, look, the, 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 like the, the, the currency of things? the world, literally the currency of the yeah. world. I mean, it's the it's the dollar is the hundred dollar bill. You can yeah. buy anything anywhere. Oh yeah. With Ben Franklin on the front. Well, not only that, you know, like having traveled around the world into a lot of really nasty places, when we would reimburse people for travel or whatever, and we'd end up giving them greenbacks, right? Like they would be so happy. Right. Because you want that stuffed under your mattress. They don't want to stuff Lira or Nigerian, whatever, those <laughs> right. things where you need to, an entire right. grocery bag underneath your mattress. Right, you the want Venezuelan peso, bill. that's it. Right. You right. know, two, 25 yeah. trillion to the dollar. <laughs> Literally yeah, once right. in Nigeria, like I sent this guy, gave him 100 bucks, go buy gas. Like the guy who's my driver, he comes yeah. back with a garbage bag because they give him his change in local. Right. Oh, Jesus. Right? Like because of hyperinflation. <laughs> right. People, but that's what people want. Like, and there, you don't mess around with that because. Quite honestly, people in America benefit from that. You think it, and the people who benefit most are, the, are the, a lot of the people who sit on the banner line by paying lower prices, lower interest rates. Right. All of those things. Your car is cheaper. Your house is cheaper. You, the groceries you buy are cheaper. Right. Because of that. And it's part of the reason why we have the trade debt. And yet they sit and let somebody like Donald Trump demagogue the trade debt as if we're losing money off of that. It's right. actually it's a benefit off of that. So, but, but Rick, so these 18 members, right, again, right. they're in swing districts. Um, the Cook Political Report, the same day that we put out our memo, listed these 18 districts right. as... And a as, couple more, but... Yeah, you know, as, yeah. as toss-ups, right, right, for the right. sake of this argument. Um, but here's a question that, you, that we were talking about before we started airing is, do you believe that when push came to shove, any of these 18 would, it, when asked, and we should ask them, and if you're out there, ask, mm -hmm. will you vote for Donald Trump if he's the nominee in 2024? 
they, every single one of them, I assure you, every single one of them will say, first off, they'll temporize. They'll say, mm-hmm. well, I think it's time for a change in the party. It's a long way between now and the primary. I don't know what's going to be the, who our nominee will be, but it's going to be somebody who believes like I do. It's a lie. Mm-hmm. Every single one of them, mm-hmm. when it comes down to it, will say, I will vote for Donald Trump. He's the right. nominee of my party, and, it, and the choice is between communism, Satanism, and dog-eating in public right. versus Donald Trump. They will, they, will, they will elide, and they will ignore everything that's happened. They will pretend that Donald Trump is a normal Republican candidate, part two. Right. They will say January 6th was a tourist visit. All of their posturing, all of their bullshit, all of their fake right. um, you know, piety about, I'm a, I'm a centrist problem solver. I'm just here to do bipolar. But it's only all one crap. of them, only one of them, David Valadeo, who I do believe walks around with a magic horseshoe up his rear end because no one can beat him in right. that district in the Valley <laughs> in California, right. no matter how many times they try. He's the only one left of the 10 that voted to impeach Donald Trump. Right. That's right. The rest are gone. Either no, there's a guy in Washington State, isn't there? No, she lost. No, Jamie the other, the other, Dan Newhouse won. Oh, okay. So there, there's so two. There's two. two. But cool. of these New, 18, New but of yeah, these right. 18, Newhouse, right. Newhouse none, is a none part of this. Of none of this posturing. And and I don't understand why people in the media space and in Washington and beyond haven't figured out this game yet. These are in soft Republican districts. They are all in danger, and so they play this game where they say, I'm not like Marjorie Taylor Greene, I'm not like Matt Gates. I'm not like Donald Trump. But the reality is, every one of those 18 people voted to make Kevin McCarthy yeah. and Marjorie Taylor Greene a power couple. Right. Every single one of them voted for the rule in the House that established all these ludicrous witch but, hunt commissions. But Rick, do their voters care? Does that really matter? Look, the idea that they're going to accomplish something that isn't that stuff, they're never going to take a hard vote. They'll right. say, yeah, I voted, for the, I voted for a bill that was already going to pass. Right. You know, like veterans health care. Everybody's going to vote for the veterans health care thing. Right. They pretend that that's the real fight. But the real fight is really about protecting our democracy. Right. The real fight is not letting this authoritarian statism grow and grow and grow. The real fight is not setting a culture war tone and tenor inside the legislative body in this country where we have real problems and real issues and where they're going to go out and they're going to spend a whole lot of time debating Hunter Biden's laptop. So, so Trigby, let's talk about that because, you know, you, you take the Trump piece of it, you take the MAGA piece of it. Again, McCarthy sold out MAGA, right. or sold out the House, I should say, to MAGA. Yeah. Um, so are these guys, are, I mean, are they the Vichy French? Are they fellow travelers? Because here's what, here's what I'm hearing, right? Mm-hmm. Just, let's just lay it out on the table. They're just trying to return the Republican Party to what it was under George W. Bush. <laughs> well, I don't think it's going back to what it was under George well, W. Bush. Well, has human history ever gone backward? Have we uh, literally ever done like the Superman thing where we spin the earth until it goes backwards? I don't think that happens right. in real life. I mean, here's the thing. Like, they, they should be doing more. Like, they actually are in a position where they can do more. In the battle sort of between autocratic forces and democratic forces, there's always... People who are irredeemable, Don Jr., people like that, right. and then redeemable. I think Don Bacon probably could be redeemable, but like Don Bacon's actually in a place where he could have impact. It's one of the, I was thinking when Rick was talking, it, you know, it's a little bit like Paul Ryan. He's quite concerned about Donald Trump, but he doesn't believe Donald Trump's going to be the nominee. And every time he's back in Wisconsin, now he's, you know, saying, but he won't come out and say, well, I'm going to support, he'll constantly say, I'm going to support the Republican nominee. Look, I and no, say- no one on the press, because they all wish Donald Trump would go away and are kind of like, you know, the same. I would take them saying, I would, listen, I, I, would, I would declare a truce with these people if they would say, if Donald Trump's the nominee, I'm going to oh. spoil my vote. I'm not going to vote. Yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write in Ronald Reagan. I'm gonna well, write for me, in. they, they got to do two things. Yeah. They got to promise that they will not allow the United States to default. Yeah. <laughs> right. Kind of a big and, deal. and two, they got to say they won't vote for Trump. Right. Right. Frankly, and, and, they should support Ukraine too. Right. Well, but the, the idea, not. though, <laughs> the idea, though, that anybody calls their bullshit, it's what makes Lincoln Project really a unique force. Mm-hmm. We are willing to tell the truth about what the world really is doing and not pretend to, you know, we're in D.C. today, which is a town full of illusions mm-hmm. about totally. itself. I'm going to break the fifth wall here, or fourth wall. Totally. Washington's illusions are that it's all a game. 
It's all a prank. It's all a stunt. It's all just a big show. It's not a big show anymore. The minute people kicked down the doors of our capital, mm -hmm. the minute people went in there with murder in their hearts, and by providence and luck and the Capitol Police and the DCPD and guys like Mike Fanone uh, protecting them, the only reason we don't have dead members of Congress and Donald Trump as our, as our, as our illegal right. president is that blind ass luck. These people understand that their base thinks that Donald Trump had the election stolen from him, 70 plus percent. 70 percent of Republican voters right. believe that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. And, and, and because of that deep irreality in Washington, where they still write stories like, George Santos then said, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's absurdity. You know, and Mitt Romney, to his great credit last night, just fucking said, you don't belong here to George Santos. Yeah. And it, 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 it really sort of broke that little spell of like, there's a, they're, they're, both parties are basically normal and this is just all a show. Right. It's not a show anymore. Donald Trump believes that he has, that he's beyond the law. His people believe that any critique of him from, a, from the legal or judicial perspective is the deep state trying to take him out. Right. They believe in hallucinations and conspiracies and crazy talk that is, that is well outside of any American political tradition. And it's not that it, that, that it, it's, it's not that we don't like it because it's new. We, like, we dislike it because it will dissolve the bonds of the constitutional republic in which we live. Right. You know what is funny with Romney, right? It's pretty good trash talking to, Santa, uh, to Santos, oh. saying you don't belong here. Yeah. And it, what it reminded me of when I first saw the clip, this guy you think this is funny, it reminded me of playing hockey when you're, you're like, in my men's league, occasionally I'll tell somebody, you know what, you don't belong here, you suck at hockey, what are you doing here? And if they don't have a good response because they do in fact suck at hockey, they'll respond, you're an asshole. That's all that right. Santos can do, and, right? And, and, right? I mean, that, who are better trash so, talkers than hockey players, right? really? It's right. true. I mean, it, like, actually, that is game. true. Peak right. It is game. true. So, so let, let's, let's shift forward, guys, uh, as we're talking about where the Republican Party is here and as we're, we're going into 2024. So first, I want to start with the Republican field, and then I want to I go to this idea that there's, that's been popping really for the last few months, but had a little boomlet again this week about this idea of an independent bid, which, which we right. can go chapter and verse on. So mm -hmm. as we're speaking this morning, um, the forces of MAGA and ultra MAGA, Steve Bannon, Roger Stone, mm -hmm. Donald Trump, mm -hmm. are all in on Ron DeSantis and potential peccadilloes. <laughs> um, yesterday, DeSantis, or excuse me, yesterday Trump T tweets a picture or truths, whatever we're calling it now, a picture of Ron DeSantis and three young women when he was a high school teacher. Then Roger Stone and these other people are saying now that DeSantis has had an affair with some woman from Newsmax. Emerald Max. Robinson from, uh, from, I think she got fired from OAN and went to Newsmax or uh, so one. If you get fired, if you're too crazy for one of those things, Right, you're too crazy. But but, anyway. but let's let's talk about it, Rick, in the broader context because we get a lot of questions. Obviously. We've always, you know, we started as an anti-Trump, never yep. Trump organization. Yep. We remain that today, but we get a lot of questions about, well, what about DeSantis? Mm -hmm. And not so much from people um, who we spend a lot of time with, who we, I think, all have a, a pretty low opinion of DeSantis politically, yeah. right? right. Um, but from, from the donor class, from what we would call civilians. So talk about what, what this new sort of front in the De DeSantis-Trump sort of fight means for 24. Well, you know, a lot of people around DeSantis right now come from two primary groups. Mm -hmm. The very wealthy donor class, who culturally never liked Donald Trump, but they bent the knee mm -hmm. in 16 and 20. And they got what they wanted. And they got what they wanted, which is a massive tax cut. Right. right. Those people are mostly very liberal Republicans. They are business and, and transactionally driven. Mm -hmm. They are globalists. They are pro-immigration. Like they, the Cokes. They are pro-abortion or pro-choice, however you want to phrase it. Right. Um, they, they want the advantage of a Republican president without the criminality and insanity of Donald Trump. They thought that was going to be Ron DeSantis. Right. So that group loves him. The cham U.S. Chamber of Commerce is so far up Ron DeSantis' ass right now, and they, they have made so many deals with him to attack Trump 
Um, and the, and they're, they're working all these angles to try to, to make Ron DeSantis. Meanwhile, just as an aside, the U.S. chamber is now under attack by Kevin McCarthy and the MAGAs who are saying Correct. that they're going to call the chamber executives into hearings about the fact that they supported Democrats. But, but the chamber right now is doubled down. They are all in on DeSantis for, right. for 2024. The U.S. chamber is very pro-immigration. All these things that, that the MAGAs, and DeSantis has made the same deal with them. He said, guys, I'm jerking these people off. They're all idiots. I'm going to take care of them for you. But let me wage my culture war while I'm doing it. Right. Um, so those super mega the wealthy donors, they're all in on DeSantis right now. The other group that's in with DeSantis is the National Review Cruise Ship Company. Mm -hmm. All those guys, they also don't like Trump culturally. They think DeSantis is able to achieve all these, all these quote-unquote conservative outcomes by being an asshole and bullying people through it and being right. the kind of like elbows out guy. All this is a beautiful fantasy. Right. This is Jeb Bush 2.0. This is this Without is Without the charm. Right. With that, right, exactly. <laughs> Jeb exclamation. Jeb. Please, please clap. clap. <laughs> um, but the problem is that the war is now on. Mm. And DeSantis has his fanboys and he's got about 3.2 million people on his official Twitter feed and about 1.6 on his personal Twitter feed, and he's got Christina Pushaw and her little troll army. Right. Donald Trump so is... at one point. It's like 200,000 less than you have on your Twitter feed, though. Yeah, but um, I got 1.5, somewhere yeah, in there. Somewhere I don't know. Back. I'm closing that. I'll, people, help me beat well, Ron yeah. DeSantis. You also have, Twitter Rick, feed. Let me beat also Ron say DeSantis. this, that Rick, at this point in time, you have as good a chance of being the Republican nominee as Ron DeSantis. This is you where I'm who headed. else is behind him, though, <clears throat> here? And maybe I'm more sensitive to this because I'm here. Then there's the operative class. Yeah. Like, actually, the, mm -hmm. the decent operative class of, like, A-teamers mm -hmm. who all kind of got pushed aside for, you know, B-teamers and appeasers yeah. and richers. Um, they are all in because they think he can win and they can manage him. Right. And, and so, like, and honestly, what's crazy about that is that reinforces the media narrative because, of course, they all hang out together. together. Right, 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 as you your dinner, right, and so the media is all like, "Oh yeah, DeSantis, this is our way of not having Trump back," and he's just, right. and so you have this operative class of people who were like, "Helped President Bush win," who and and tons of Republicans who are just basically McConnell but, world. So, I, but but I mean, but that's but they're, they're delusional talk. because no one in none of the mag is in Wisconsin. But, guys, is but, a but let me let me flip with the U.S. Look, chamber or those. But I have stuff. I have a name none for these zero. people, right? I call them nor, normative utopians. Yes. Right, which is they want a <laughs> world back that does not exist. Right. Ronald Reagan, George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush, Mitt Romney. Take your pick. Never ever ever clear Republican primary today and probably don't for the foreseeable future. So what I don't understand, guys, and it's like, you know, Larry Hogan. Let's take Larry Hogan as we're talking about 2024 sure. or Chris right. Sununu from New Hampshire, right? They both do interviews on the same day, mm -hmm. right, where they're, they, they go through all this stuff, right? We need to do this. We need to do this. We need to do this. Move on, move on. New generation, yada, yada, yada. Would you vote? Will you support Trump if he's the nominee? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then... You vaporized your only reason for being right. in this yep. primary. You're done. Right? right? It's over. Because at that point, and then, of course, and this goes back to the conventionality of all these candidates. What does Hogan's team do? Then they try and walk it back as quickly as they can, but they right. don't walk it back all the way. Right. They don't say, I will never vote for Donald Trump. Right. Fuck him. Right. But that's the thing is, like, they have to go clean stuff up because they're they're operating in a world trigby that doesn't exist anymore. When Donald Trump says something... He says it, and nobody tries to clean it up. Watch you know why? Happens. Because he doesn't care what he says this anyway. This is the irony of it. You know, you know what I would say to those people, and she's never going to be the Republican nominee, and he's never going to be the Republican nominee for president. But they're a hell of a lot more popular nationally, and respected. Is Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger right? Right. They're never going to be the Republican, but they've at least figured it out that right. they speak to a far larger audience and are actually respected and really supported. Than Chris Sununu or Hogan or the rest of these Chris guys Christie, will ever the be vanity, right. the because they've been true to their principles. The vanity candidates right now essentially are everyone in this race but Donald Trump. Right. Donald Trump has two big assets that, that, that he has not even started to deploy yet. His base will stick with him. Yeah. At a, and, and I always say to people, if he only holds 15 to 20 percent of the Republican base, he wins the primaries easily. You guys know... Mm -hmm. 
It's a much larger it's number. About forty five percent. Yeah, it's yeah. about forty five percent. The second thing that that Ron in a one on one with Ron DeSantis, yeah. he beats him sixty forty. Yeah, right. Sixty thirty five. The thing about DeSantis right now that no one has grappled with yet is that Trump's audience is conditioned for the last seven years to believe ludicrous bullshit. Mm-hmm. So when he goes back on Twitter proper and with his 80 some million, 88 million and followers. And Facebook and Instagram. And Facebook and Insta, he's gonna be back, he's back on all the platforms. When and he'll be on TikTok where he, he will have a massive audience as massive, well, which a lot of younger kids. Uh-huh, when he says Ron DeSantis is a groomer pedophile, right. it'll right. be just like saying, you shove a UV light up your ass and drink bleach and you're going to cure COVID. Right. Because you know what? There's a lot of Americans. There are millions and millions and millions and millions of Americans who believe everything he says. And so DeSantis does not, all these conventional wisdom guys, think they're going to run a nuts and bolts campaign. Yeah. And by the way, so DeSantis is about 50 or 60 in the bank right now. That's a lot of it's fungible, but not some of it's not. And he's going to raise a lot of money from big donors. It won't matter. The minute he starts a campaign, it's going to be all these consultants are going to come in and go, you got to hire my five guys in Iowa right. and my 17 people in South Carolina. And you got to buy off these guys in, in, in New Hampshire. you got to go to Nevada and buy off this guy and this guy and that guy. And the money just fucking vaporizes. Jeb Bush, $250 million. Mike Murphy shit the bed and burned it in a fucking bonfire. And it went away. They were sending iPads to people with ads. Yeah. I know. Remember when they I did know. that? I remember. It was nuts. I remember. It was Insanity. Crazy. And that's, um, that Jeb seems so Bush. quaint now. Jeb Bush. <laughs> uh, so you got Jeb Bush. You got Marco raised about a buck fifty. Same story. Yeah. You got Rudy Giuliani in, ni- in 2008 raised 200 plus million dollars. Vaporized. By the end of it, they couldn't pay their fucking credit card bills. Right. The, all these people who think that they're going to get on the consultant gravy train with Ron DeSantis um, are out of their mind. Here's the other thing. They lost they by doing through they, that money. But here's the other piece. Like, and I hate to get too in the weeds here, but no, we please. can. Here's the other piece that the three of us know, right? In, in 2016, Donald Trump with Corey Lewandowski driving right. the freaking bus in the primary. Right. Right, like that would be like winning the World Series game with Bob from the local high school on the mound throwing. Right, pitches. Uncle Rico. Uncle yeah. Rico. <laughs> right, like you're not putting Roger Clemens or no. Cy right. Young on right. the mound. You're like, right, literally. right. But this time, this time he's actually got people like Susie and Chris Lasavita who actually come out of that world of of major league and, and, right. and, and, I, and, and know what they're doing and. And honestly, I don't think that La Vida, I know Chris well, yeah. I don't think Chris is losing a wink of sleep no. over Listen, Ron DeSantis they're, at they're, the moment. They're, they're None. Right now. Zero. Susie Wiles thinks None. about Ron DeSantis because Casey humiliated Susie Wiles. Mm-hmm. That story, <laughs> and that, that ain't that's good a for, gift. That, that ain't no, good for Ron DeSantis. No, I don't play that game. Right. That's a gift that will keep on giving. But but they, they understand Trump doesn't need all the infrastructure. You've said this before. Right. He, he needs a cell phone and an airplane. And right. Got and a field to put a rally. Right. But here's what I, here's what it gets for us, like and for our, for our listeners who are watching, right? Who've been supportive. So one of the things that the establishment class here and the Republican side has never understood about the Lincoln Project is like who all of you are. Like they just assume that the Lincoln Project, oh, it's just a bunch of far-left people who are backing them, that there is that center. The sa- and it's right, it's center, it's left, right? Sure. Like, it's this bigger coalition, sort of like the Liz Cheney thing. They don't understand that. But what we understand this time, and I'm, I don't know if Democrat operatives understand it, and I certainly think some of the people on the other side of the political field don't understand it, is Donald Trump is a different beast this time for both the primaries and the general election yep. because he actually has real people like yep. serious people who around him in those spots. Now, well, whether he'll listen or not, I don't know. But if you look at the destruction that they're raining on Ron DeSantis today, it does appear like they're at least listening and they're channeling some of the, some of the, what Trump does best is awful attack, and pathetic attack, it right, is attack. with yep. capable people amplifying it and hammering him. And right. it wouldn't be and surprised if they the had Lincoln digital Project, ads Like I think we understand that we face them. something that in some ways is a greater threat today than it was when For sure. we faced no in 2020. No question. The because he divided. had clowns. He yeah. had right. clowns. Well, and, and let's just say this, in um, that in 2020, he killed 800,000 Americans. They yeah. ran the Bernie Sanders playbook mm-hmm. against Joe Biden, who is not Bernie Sanders, right, right. and he almost won. Yeah, right. So like we should won. just never we should never take anything for granted. And speaking of taking things for granted. So there's been this it's 
Look, we've had this every year, every four years for, I don't know, since 1980, since John Anderson, yep. right? Actually, that's not true. 1948, Strom Thurmond ran the Dixiecrat ticket. 1968, 68. George Wallace yep. ran the segregation ticket. It was basically the same Didn't thing. did George right? Wallace actually win some states? Yeah, so did, yeah. So did Strom yeah. Thurmond. They both won yeah, the Confederacy, both. basically. Yeah, right. Basically. Um, but now we're back. It's 2024. There are surveys out that show that Democrats don't really want Joe Biden and Republicans don't really want Donald Trump and Americans don't really don't want either of them. Ergo, we must now be in line, Rick, for the magical third party unity mm -hmm. ticket, the independent line that will save us from the the awfulness that we're experiencing today because there will be this minted savior that will ride in on a white horse with every plutocrat's name tattooed on the back of it. So tell us a little bit about why we're here and why it's the same fantasy that we've been talking about this whole episode. I would say there are about a dozen people in the country who really understand third party <laughs> politics and three of them are sitting in this room. Right. Mm -hmm. We've all been to this rodeo. Yeah. It is, it's not just the hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. The electoral college and the way states are, are, are the legislative basis of, of ballot access in the states makes it impossible. It is not going to happen. You, can, you could hope for like weird hat trick things where the election gets divided so closely it gets thrown into Congress. That was the McMullen strategy. You could try to work through how, much, how many billions does it take, the Schultz or Bloomberg strategy. Mm -hmm. And every time people with serious resources have approached this, They've realized it's not a matter of just the money. It's the structure of the electoral college system, and that's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. Why? Because both parties believe that the, that the electoral college system is to their advantage mm -hmm. in the long term. Right, which it is. And, you know, both uh, the Democrats believe, okay, we're always going to have the West Coast and New York and Massachusetts and Vermont and Rhode Island, and that's a good starting point. And the Republicans believe we're going to have the Deep South and Texas and Florida, and that's going to be a, a good starting point. That system is not going to go away in 24 mm -mm. or in 28 or in any conceivable scenario. One of the things about the Lincoln Project people forget sometimes is that we live in the real world. Right. We live in the actual world where shit is real, where the nuts and bolts have to be turned a certain way for the machine to operate. And there is no system right now where any third party candidate is going to get on the ballot in enough states to get 270 electoral votes. It's a fantasy. It is going to elect Donald Trump. There is one, one third party candidate who can make a difference in 2024, and that is Donald Trump. Right. Where if he gets pissed off after losing the Republican nomination for some reason and goes away, he'll still not have 270, but he'll go out like a suicide bomber and go into the states and they'll put Don Jr. on the ballot in a bunch or of- Or somebody else. As an independent line item. Kanye. Kanye, Don Jr., whatever the fuck it is, enough to, 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 to wreck chaos on the, on the ballot and cause the Republicans to lose. Right. Yeah, and they'll do it in the, I think it's 22 states that you could really, after the Meaning, primaries yeah, have gotten right. over, that would mean something where you could put them in. So, right. but, but Trigby, let's talk but about- But even with sore loser, he could still get it well, on no, I'm saying, state. but even yeah. like with Don Jr., if right. you're doing that, you're probably, I mean, but some of them- the ballot access requirement is, is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So let, let, those, yeah, those. yeah, I mean, we do too. I mean, Rick, <laughs> yeah. Trigby and I have been through yeah. this through this rodeo, but and, as you have with Evan. Well, McMullen. you went through it more than I did. I just listened to you talk. About it. <laughs> but <laughs> so Trigby, let's talk about the math. Let's let's That's for foolish. argument's sake say, um, like the No Labels group has said that they have seventy million dollars to create ballot lines in all fifty states. That's one thing, yeah. right? Then you have to create a process that is at least sufficiently quote unquote independent, right? Because if it's not an independent process for this, then you're basically giving this person a $70 million in-kind contribution, right? right? Which is illegal. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm sure would be, you know, every, every party in every state would sue based on the fact that this was oh, a, trust a, corrupt, me, the, a corrupted the, the, thing. The immune system of, of the, the bipartisan immune system of trying to keep third party out. In Believe states. me, I, I mean, I tried You've to do it for there, two dude. years. I got I one ballot line in New, New York, York, right? Right, and it's gone. Right, <laughs> four years. And I think the thing is, well, you and I went through this. Like when you look at a state, I think it's North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. Like in that state, they could file almost immediately, and given what the ballot access rules are, 
they would have no problem taking that and setting a precedent and just right. running it across everywhere. And, and, and so, but yeah. also so they've North Carolina have out of the Republican mix, where you got, right. you're, you're in deep shit. Right. So let's let's say you get all 50 states. Let's say yeah. you have a candidate, both for president and vice president, because there are some states like Texas, right, where once you file for ballot access, you have to file your presidential nominee, your vice presidential nominee, all 35 electors, yada, yada, yada. That's May 3rd, first week of May, let's yeah, say, right. right? So you've already got your VP nominee, which gives them another vector to attack you on. They'll, let's say that they put a, Republic, a moderate Republican at the top and a moderate Democrat at the bottom, right? right. Let's say it's Some Larry Hogan and Joe. Don't Jones. let you have candidates from different parties right. on the so, ballot. So on you, even on that the, is true. Okay, so you'd have to. All right, so you'd have to shed your partisan yep. Yep. ideology, mm -hmm. right, uh, which <laughs> gives you another vector. Yeah. And then there's the reality of like, okay, who's really going to do this? Because we've seen Trigby, and I've seen this personally. Is mm -hmm. if you ask an American voter, do you want more choices? The answer is yes. And no one believes that American voters should have more choices than me. Right. Right. But once you ask them, would you vote for that independent? The number goes to the floor. So so that, as you know, I ended up doing a bunch of focus groups on democracy and stuff for right. for for in both the U.S. and the U.K. Um, and it was fascinating because the U.K. team that was helping do the study in the U.S. understands three dimensional, four dimensional politics. Right. Because right? they have multiple parties right. in, a, in a way that we don't. And I think you saw some of the focus groups that we were doing. Um, it, people People say, in fact, more people say they would vote for a third party candidate than say, yes, I definitely vote Democrat or Republican. Mm -hmm. But the issue is they don't want to throw away their vote. Right. And, and the issue is that they have partisan leanings going in and anybody who announces that they're running at the start is going to take more from one side than the other. Mm -hmm. Right. And so inevitably there's going to be a huge amount of pressure as there was with Howard Schultz from the Democrats. Right. You're going to you're going to wreck this. Make Donald right. Trump get elected. Right. Because those other people are like holding out, I'm not going to vote for him if it means Trump's going to win, right? So right. like they come later, right. right, in the process. So there's so many pieces that would have to go right. I'm not saying it's impossible. I think it could happen because, I mean, for years everybody thought the world was flat and right. it wasn't flat. Like lots of people never thought Donald Trump could be elected president. Right. If and in the right set of circumstances you can have, uh, it could happen. But you can't risk that when literally it's Donald Trump or the end of democracy. Right. That's the consequence. Right. The risk reward consequence matrix of this is a disaster so, in 2024. So, Reed, what do you think about this? I mean, this whole idea of like no labels and other groups trying to recruit these third parties. Terrible. I, my feeling is, it, it, like Joe Manchin's apparently their like new flavor right. that they're talking to. You put Joe Manchin on the ballot, you're going to pull conservative Democrats off of Biden. Right. Correct. Right. If that's their objective to, get, to elect Donald Trump, that's how you would do it. If I was Trump and I had $70 million Absolutely. hidden away somewhere, I'd go out and see if I could find a conservative Democrat. Well, why did they want to get Kanye to run? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, peel off African. That was the whole, what the whole thing. But was I mean, that, but that's I think to Trigby's point though about playing with fire, right? This is not like the Democratic Party propping up a MAGA guy right, in, in the primary in a, house in a U.S. House yeah. race, right? This is like. Oh, you know what? The house is on fire. Let's put a new bathroom in. And right? like, it doesn't yeah. make any goddamn sense. It's a vanity. It's a vanity project. And, the, and vanity. But the vanity project costs you the whole ball game. Right. But the, right. But the vanity project Could. is is existential to the country's future as a democratic, uh, you know, functioning democratic society. Here's the here's the thing: is that uh, part of it is what's the game you're playing, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Everybody thinks about doing a, the third party run in the context of an election. The truth of the matter is, you know, it's really like a colored revolution. It's about tearing down an entrenched bureaucracy. Right. Right. The two party system hasn't been challenged in 150 years. Mm -hmm. it's, right. it's existed for 150 years. Right. Hasn't been challenged in about 100. Ross Perot did demonstrate that you can get. 30%. 30%. Yeah, and if he it, wasn't insane, who knows what he, would have happened. He, he potentially could have won. Now, Larry, but again, he was Larry, a self funder shops, built around a single set of issues with two candidates who had some real flaws. George H.W. Bush, people thought he was disconnected. Bill Clinton, they weren't sure exactly what he was. Right. Perot potentially could have run the middle. But, like, that gets to the other piece of it. To, to effectively do this, you got to be on the debate stage. The rules right. of the Presidential Debate Commission say you have to be at 15%. Republican Party has now said they're not going to honor the debate right. commission, probably in part because they're afraid of this or they want to be able to have some control over it. 
like all of those pieces. And, they would, and, and, and if you get to summer, honestly, like we're political operatives. If we're running one of the two major party campaigns, and there's somebody who looks like they're getting traction and going up and is going to be on that debate stage with your guys, what's the first thing you're going to do? Right. You're going to call yeah, your colleague who's running yep. the Democrats' campaign or the Republicans' campaign. The other campaign manager going to be like, hey, man, like we got to sync this yeah. before yep. it takes off. And you're going to have both sides it drop is, and torpedoes it is, on. It is a bipartisan immune response. For sure. And, and you've got to have, yeah. if you're doing the third party thing, you got to have somebody that's actually capable at the point that that happens. Right. Start the Jesse Ventura thing and to be able to effectively say to the American people, look at both sides are attacking me. I must be doing something but right you, and channel that. You, it's, it's impossible. It's such a bad idea for 2020. Somebody, I mean, to get that Terrible. number. So ordinarily, a candidate basically buys their way into the ball game. Mm -hmm. Right. Where you go out, you run for office, you get known, you get name ID, you run advertising, you become a known quantity. Right. Whoever the third party candidate would be, is by nature going to need to be a self-funder because there's not enough money out there in the world in this squishy moderate middle idea illusion right. to fund a real presidential campaign. They need to be somebody with charisma and presence. Like, look, Howard Schultz, God bless him, was just not a guy who set the room on fire with charisma. Mike Bloomberg is a yeah. very specific flavor. He's not a right. guy who people go, I need me some more Mike Bloomberg. Right. None of those things come easy. The money, the money part, there, there are plenty of billionaires out there. There are not a lot of politically agile, charismatic, good-looking, presentable billionaires who could go out and play in a political environment in a year. Right. Because, guys, a year from now, the Republican primary will be balls out, mm. on fire, blazing. Yes. It will be a nuclear fucking war a year from now. Or... It won't be at all. Or, <laughs> or Donald Trump will, or or Donald Trump will look, surrender slowly to Donald Trump. slit the throats right. of each and an individual. E yeah. e because look, once DeSantis is out of the way, right, the rest. Nikki Haley's Nikki Haley, Nikki, will, Haley will Nikki Haley, Haley, Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, yeah. they're gone. I heard yesterday. And they're dirty. They're, like dirtied they're dirtied up. They're dirtied up. Right. Yeah. They're dirtied they up. All, they all. They owe all. All. You know. Um, but but let let's finish up on this on this twenty four thing because a couple of things. One is Rick, as you noted, right is you start something like this, there's a boomlet, yeah. right? But then as, you, as political gravity starts to take hold, all of those billionaire financial backers that you're talking about who <laughs> were in for $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, whatever, go, eh. Oh, listen, I've described that life cycle before. And it's just like in 2016. I'm with Jeb Bush. He's the smartest candidate in the field. He's going to be a great president. The history right. is dad. da uh, and he's been a great conservative governor of Florida, and I'm never, ever, ever leaving Jeb. Eh. And then it's like, yeah, Jeb, listen, I, I, I'm not going to go with Trump, but you're, you're falling apart, man. I'm going to have to give Marco or Ted some money. Right. Just, I, just don't take it personally, okay, man? Right. And then a few weeks later, it's like to all of them, hey, listen, I'm gonna, I've got I've got to pull out. I'm, not, I'm, yeah. I'm concerned about my yeah. business in the field. And then it's Mr. Trump, where should I wire the million dollars? Right, right, right. Mr. But, Trump. So there's the financial aspect. And then, Trigby, let's say that this, this, this mystical unicorn gets to November of 2024. No one gets to 270 electoral votes. It goes to the United States House. Mm -hmm. What are the chances, given the nature of both Congress and the parties, that somehow this unicorn would be the consensus choice of 26. And of course, what people forget is right. it's not the number of members of Congress. Right. It's, it's each the state's delegation. Each delegation. So Reed's asking a leading question here because he knows that I wrote a memo once. <laughs> so he knows what it says. <laughs> Me? <laughs> <laughs> you know exactly what I think about this. Right. Um, so I think it depends on what percentage the, 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 that candidate has gotten, how many states that they've carried. Right. I do think that if you had a scenario where, where that independent candidate had reached a high enough threshold that they had gotten the highest number of votes it would and had carried enough states it would become very very hard for members of congress who you know i mean they demonstrate all the time they don't have a lot of uh, right. stomach for right. for that and they would realize there's clearly you know a different path that they would be able to prohibit that person mm -hmm. and block them because i just think yeah, I mean, they could do that constitutionally, but I think that would be really hard. The bottom line is, though, like that candidate's going to have to get to 43 percent. 
if you have Joe Biden and Donald Trump on the ballot, like they're not, they're they're not getting, getting a third party percent. person getting to that percent. Also to Rick's point, which is a great one, right? Like I have this whole theory and I talk about it actually in that same memo. You know, moments meet their man, not men meet their moments, right? Mm -hmm. our, part of our problem is we have these politicians who all look in the mirror. I think Ted Cruz is the greatest example of this. I think this is the moment for Ted, that Theodore is what yeah. America wants right now. Raphael. But Raphael. Raphael. But, um, but the truth of the matter is like Zelensky. Zelensky wasn't really very popular. He was kind of fading as a president. And then he met his moment and he rose to the moment. Right. Whoever... As the, Biden has right. a couple of times. Yeah. Biden has a couple of times too. Whoever that candidate is, is there may be that magic moment. Right. They've got to be... They have to have the ability, first and foremost, to stand on the debate stage and pull it off. Right. That this, this person is serious and is a better alternative. That's a, you know, it's president of the United States, and that's the point they're real. But then they got to capitalize on it. they got to be able to do like Zelensky did. And, and, and Putin under, that's, it's kind of the same thing. Like, like, everybody underestimates, which that was one of the faults that, you know. I mean, think about what Joe Biden offered Zelensky. How do we get you out of the country? Right. I don't need a ride. I need ammo. Man. Right. How about this, How though? do you need that moment? Think about this issue, too. A lot of the people doing the third-party idea right now are also living in the fantasy of the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're thinking conventional Democrat, conventional Republican, third-party candidate, both parties have disaffected, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> They're not. They've got an insane authoritarian madman who will stop at nothing, right. right? Who will slaughter them in public? Whose whose followers are murderous and yeah. insane? Mm -hmm. Who will never who storm the U.S. Capitol? Who, who will never, if they'd right. gotten a member of Congress, they'd have they would. And and they tried to kill Nancy Pelosi. And by, and by the way, well, they, yeah, they, they got her, they almost killed her husband. If they if they had killed, I say this, I've said this a lot. If they had killed a member of Congress that day. Mm -hmm. They would have all. They would have canceled the session. They would not have held the certification vote. They would have run, and Trump would have had weeks and weeks to fuck around. And he'd right. be president. But I think that was the plan. It was he the would plan. have declared martial law. Of course, it that's was. That's the irony. He would have. He would have. Right. It's a little bit like this Antifa it's attack. It's like Putin. I'm going to blow up the building. Right. Blame the Chechens for it, yep. and then use that as the rationale for me to get reelected. Oh, it's a Reichstag elected. fire. Yeah, right? Right. yeah, I mean, right. that's exactly sure. what it is. And that is what they were planning. And in hindsight, right, do you remember this? This will be a good insight that you didn't see in the documentary or anywhere else. But do you remember when we were out in Park City and they always started talking about color revolutions? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I called yeah. you yeah. and we were, like, we're under lockdown. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what is this about? Right. In hindsight, Lynn I just thought was of this at us. Exactly. He's like, they're trying to lead a color revolution. But were, it was actually what they were trying in yeah. some ways. Well, because exactly they always a jaded way. <laughs> they always project. They always tell us what they're going to Right. Gonna do. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there today, but I think there's plenty left to talk about. Yeah. Um, so before we get out of here, Rick, where can everybody find you online? I am at the Rick Wilson on the Hellbird site of Twitter, and the Rick Wilson on Instagram, and I am also at the new uh, the Enemies List podcast. All right, at Resolute Square. So let's find everybody there. And Trigby, how about you? Uh, at Trigby Olson on Twitter. Awesome. As always, gang, uh, you can find me on Twitter and TikTok at Reed Galen and on Instagram at Reed Galen underscore LP. Thanks again to Rick and Trigby for joining and everybody for watching and listening. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, everybody.